Okay. All right, folks, we're going to begin if everyone can be seated. Uh, welcome to the October pre-Halloween meeting of the Transit Riders Council. Uh, we didn't all wear our costumes today, but we, <laughs> we understand what's coming. Right, your costume, Andrew. Thank you. Um, may we have approval of the agenda? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, the minutes, has everyone had a chance to review them? Andrew, they can make a motion to approve the minutes as read. Second, then. Uh, oh. question. Go ahead, Stuart. Sorry. I read, I read the minutes, and I know I asked um, the guests an additional question, not just about self, uh, um, selling pre packaged repairs. I can't recall all of the specific questions, but it's definitely not complete. I asked her other questions about timeline and other aspects of the program. And she couldn't answer them or said we'd have to get that. But I don't remember the specifics. So I don't know. It would be in the recording, I'm, I'm assuming. Okay, yeah. So it's, it's too simplistic for me. Because that wasn't the focus of the Sure. Okay. Do you like us to um, add your other questions and then Right. Yeah. Remember that I've done is to simplify the minutes. I know, but I think I said some more stuff. Okay. Things, so. We will review the recording and adjust accordingly. If I was babbling, you'll let me know. <laughs> I'll refrain from this. You, you, you tend to not do that. Yeah. We'll remove the babbling inserted little thing that we have afterwards. Right. Okay. No, if you remember, Stu, I had this thing when Dick Ravage was here, and I and it was it was all online, but not printed, and he asked where you know everything he said. So that's when we had that. But I now understand that it was too much. We're trying to make the minutes a little more streamlined and I readable. And yes, but I thought I asked you something more. We'll we'll check it, Stuart. Um, May we have an approval of the minutes as submitted? I said to be amended. Uh, amended. Pending amendments as in the, as as we we find. Yes. Chris said, and I seconded it. Chris said as read, but it hasn't been oh, read. It is so, been submitted. So okay, then I will make a motion. Uh, to no, minutes accepted as. Correct. I think Sharon did, yes. Oh, then I'll you're, second you're, that. You're second. Okay. And I can take a break. Uh, <laughs> let's move on because we have a, a pretty heavy load of things to talk about today. Um, we will hear more from one of our speakers on the 20-year needs assessment, but it did come up in many places at the committee meetings on Monday. And I think the biggest issue, which continues to be coming up, is the split between those that want, that believe a state of good repair is the most important thing of the 20-year needs assessment, and we are now told it is a $1.5 trillion asset, this system, which mm -hmm. other cities can only dream about it but could never afford to build. We are lucky enough to have it built already, and we must take care of it, and many people express that concern versus the need for expansion. Uh, there are many communities that would really benefit from an expanded MTA. Uh, we have significant transit deserts in our region, uh, not as many as many other parts of the country, but there still are some that exist, and so there is that argument. Can we combine the taking care of our much-needed improvements, such as uh, resiliency and water uh, water prevention, prevention and um, uh, declining viaducts on both the railroads and our elevated trains, uh, uh, our ventilation system, uh, especially given climate change and all of that, uh, accessibility for more stations, which of course in large part will hinge on uh, congestion pricing, which we will also be discussing later. Um, so there is that argument on the 20-year needs assessment, but as I told both Jamie Torres Springer and Chair Lieber, I've been around a long time and I've seen many of these 20-year needs assessments. This is the best one I've ever seen, uh, both in research, uh, presentation, uh, uh, planning, uh, explanation, uh, and just in so many ways, this one really tops them all, and I think we'll get the attention from our funding partners that we most need, and 
one of the things that also came out in the discussion was that uh, at, APT, at the APTACON um, convention, or I guess it was a convention, conference in, in Orlando recently, uh, where Chair Lieber and, and uh, Senior VP of Subways, uh, Critchlow, and others from the MTA have attended, the other places in this country are really hoping that their states do what our state did, which was, and our legislature, which was to give us five years of a balanced budget. Um, that has really made a difference, and they are all looking for their states to do the same, because whether it's SEPTA, CTA, MBTA, uh, LA Metro, uh, San Francisco, BART, everyone is looking at service cuts and massive bear hikes if their states don't do what our state was smart enough to do, which is treat our amazing system like the essential service that it is as important as police, fire, and sanitation. It's one of the four major services. So um, that is an ongoing discussion. We will hear more about the 20-year needs assessment today uh, from Sean Fitzpatrick when he arrives. So I won't belabor that discussion too much. Um, the issue of resiliency, given the two very large rainstorms we have recently had, whether uh, the city is doing enough to make its sewers not to overflow, which many of them have continued to do. Uh, the MTA will continue to elevate the steps leading to subway entrances because that has been shown to alleviate a lot of water intrusion when the steps are raised. I see it at 86th and Broadway. It has made a huge difference. Is it one step? Uh, it's about one step height, yes. Is it going to need more? Uh, I don't think so. Oh, okay. it's, it's, a okay. it's, it's, it's a decent amount. It's not going to impair someone who's got mobility issues. You don't want to make it too high but you want to make it high enough to make sure water does not get in. And it has made a difference where it has been done. So there will be more of that. Um, I raised the issue of third-party intrusion because I've been in stations where either the building or a commercial establishment right over the subway has leaks that go into the subway stations. And yes, it is the, the point of where everything leaves, unfortunately. And they are looking at many ways to stop water from infiltrating the system. Uh, drains, uh, filters, uh, pumps, all kinds of things. And so obviously all of that costs money. And uh, one of, I think that it was Chair uh, Zuckerman of the Finance Committee raised the issue that he would like to see resiliency in, the, uh, in each year's budget and, and list it as such, as resiliency, so everybody can see how important it is and what we're doing in that, in that concern, because I don't have to remind you uh, during Ophelia, the water was just unbelievable. Um, the JFK airport area got eight and three quarters inches of rain. Central Park got five and a half, if not five and three quarters. My building got water intrusion over the skylights. I mean, it was just unbelievable. Uh, these storms are predicted to occur more frequently, which, and I saw Chief Financial Officer Willens this morning, and he told me he just saw a report about the Antarctic ice cap starting to melt and what that will do Sorry. to the level of ocean. Not starting, that's been well, it's just for, well, it's accelerating. Maybe he whatever. Just, all right, maybe he just <laughs> the quantification of um, undefined expense of the um the cost to build repair and to make the system more resilient. It's one of the recommendations that was in the work that Kara and Bradley did. Also, and, uh, Radley? Oh. Well, Karen Bradley. Yeah. yeah. Um, but if I may, the one thing, and I get close, you know, I still have some friends in the media, very few, <laughs> but anyway. Uh, but the one thing that they use as is Kim's organization, Channel 7 loves to do it, and also New York one, which they love to show the water just like Niagara Falls. I don't know what kind of resiliency, because that's not a leak, Andrew. That's not a leak from from a, a, a pipe or 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 a, a horse through there. I mean, it just comes. It rains so much on the streets, and unless you had were able to close off the steps, I mean, and I what know. What station are we talking about? A lot. Any, oh. I mean, I know it's at my station. You know, it's 77. But any station where you walk down steps. It just goes from the sidewalk to the steps, and I don't know if they, I couldn't, 
various reasons I couldn't. But we also have gratings on the sidewalks in which water comes in and flows down. Well, that's the city. So that's not us. That's the city. But there's also, that's, that's where the, the steps are, that's one of the issues in grading covers. Um, and there are, there are a number of different treatments that, um, that, can, be, that can be performed that uh, there's a whole the city and MTA camp. But, uh, but it, it's the city. It's the city sidewalks and the city. But it's the city and MTA working jointly that need to address the issue. And are fact. they? Because I didn't hear that. Yes. Yeah, in, in, in the, in they the, are working the, together. In the presentation at the board meeting yesterday. Well, I, 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 yeah. I, I didn't. They say both extensively about the work that they're doing. So it's actually worth going back and looking at. This emerged after Sandy. It, 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 yes. Yeah. Yeah. And the parts out in flushing were so yes, low. But, but, the, 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 but the September 27th Ophelia mm -hmm. storm was worse than, than Iris, even for the subways. It just flooded like unbelievably. So, what are, the, what are they looking at? Putting grading in the sidewalk yeah. so that it. They're it looking at a go variety of things. Oh. There are a whole lot of So many things. Okay. Um, it's worth looking at the process for operating agencies, which includes bridges. Uh, it's worth looking at the yeah. presentation um, that they gave yesterday, and uh, that actually that Eric Wilson spoke about it at PCAC last yes. month. Yes. Um, but they, and he spoke was, last was yesterday. Expanded upon um, and broken down across. Expanded upon uh, on a micro level. More detail. And you mean more level. more detail? I, it would take too long. Yeah, we can't. No, no, no. I'm not saying you. It's about the prison. Okay, then I will. I would say it's worth I'll go back. I have it recorded. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. What I come from yesterday. And obviously, it's not just subways because I'm sure everyone, unless you've been under a rock, have seen the landslide that happened in Briarcliff Manor in yeah. Westchester County, which stopped Amtrak and Metro North service for days. I'm, I'm, it's amazing how quickly they got two of the tracks back. Um, service has been restored, um, and while I'm on that subject, uh, not to divert, but as you know, the state of Connecticut pulled back on some of its funding for Metro North, so on the next New Haven line a schedule change, which is coming uh, shortly, you will notice there are some trains missing from that schedule. Uh, Metro North promised that they would be doing that. Um, it will not affect New York State travelers, but it will affect um, the Danbury branch, the New Canaan branch, and the main line of New Haven uh, train service. There are some mid middays and Fridays particularly, you will see service cuts because so many people are not working, going to the office on Friday, they're working remotely, so. Andrew? Yes. Yeah. Uh, just to, for the record, because this is something that the disability community has been very disturbed on this, on the Connecticut side and as well as the New York side, they, are very really angry because when they were supposed to have their meeting, it wasn't truly accessible. They ignore. Where were the meetings held, Chris? Uh, some, I think one was in New Haven and, and online. No, the online one. Yes, I was on the online one. But there were a couple of people complained that where they were going to it, there was no accessibility access. There was no communication. And the Hartford line was, will not see any service cuts. But because Shoreline East surely will. In yeah. Hartford because that's where our yeah. Of course. But they were also holding some pop-up events for the one in the mm -hmm. They didn't notice them very well, but... Agreed. Wow. So, just to, as, as Lisa is correct, also, and I, I'll back up Lisa, is, Andrew, Connecticut DOT has not really shown respect for seniors and disabilities. They're really upset. And, and other riders because they just did a service cut. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> increase, and fare increase. And fare increase, yes. But some people who want to go to the Broadway shows, they they got a prayer they can get on the train they need to connect. And not, you know, they shouldn't be traveling almost four to five hours. They've held some public meetings on the funding of rail service in Connecticut, and the public came out wholeheartedly in yeah. favor of continued funding. Um, so whether this hurts people at the ballot box, we will see. But this is going to continue to be an issue. I don't believe this is permanent. Oh. But it's oh. a Connecticut it's issue. It's not a New it's York. A Connecticut it's a Connecticut issue. So let's worry about New York. We have enough problems here to worry about. Wait, we do indeed. Um, one of those problems um, is a shortage of 
makers, producers of rail cars, both subway and commuter cars. Um, that was that came up at yesterday's uh, board meeting and at committee meetings on Monday. We are finding a shortage of places to buy subway cars. You know, ever since Alstom bought Bombardier, um, we don't seem to be interested in, in their product anymore. And the Buy American thing, you know, Kawasaki, of course, has a plant in Yonkers and in Nebraska, and we will continue to purchase Kawasaki. I think they're the best ones that we have anyway. But what, what came up was there's a Chinese company that is making rail cars for so many transit systems all over the world, and we can't use them because there's a Buy American provision. Um, I don't know how great they are and if they would come with spy equipment in them, but uh, but uh, I'm, I'm told they're very good cars, uh, but we cannot avail ourselves of them. So Is there any the lesser merit? car manufacturers we can partake of, the higher the costs are going to be because they know they've got us by the you know what. Andrew, is yes. there any American? Is there any American system that is buying these Chinese cars? No, I don't believe. No, so, so it's not just New York. It's, no, it's not it's just New York. It's the United States that. It's an American buyer. Yeah, it's no, no, that's American what I thought. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's a FRA. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's and what I thought. It's with the NPA purchase so needs, a, would, with our purchase needs alone, you would think that would be enough for. Uh, a European manufacturer, for instance, to open a plant in the, in the U.S. or a Canadian manufacturer, but Kawasaki is the one that has done that. So uh, they're going to continue to monitor that. You may know that uh, Kawasaki is late on the M on the M9s, I guess, and and other and on the 211s, they're late uh, getting us all of those. So you know, rely on one. It's a really good one, but you want to have a choice. And we don't, at the moment, seem to have that choice, which will mean uh, longer delays for new cars, uh, longer to retire cars that probably should be retired. Although I love conversational seating on the 46s, <laughs> I see the ones, you know, the 179s overtaking them, and the 211s in some cases. Um, but that's going to be a continual issue for MTA. Um, on the congestion pricing update, uh, ah. the TMRV will likely have to meet one more time. They did not submit anything to the October board. They are still working out some things, and I'm sure getting more testimony about certain things. You may have seen in the news that uh, the MTA has hired an attorney now to fight the New Jersey lawsuit. Um, Lisa was on a call this morning with congestion pricing advocates and might have some things to add and this might be the place to sure. do that. Sure. We um, actually speak regularly with uh, congestion pricing now coalition um, with, with that, uh, the same advocacy organizations that we worked with in, to get this legislation passed in 2019 and continue to work with um, towards implementation. The threat from New Jersey is not solely a lawsuit which uh, the MTA has, uh, is, is um, countering with its own suit, and uh, an amicus brief will be filed to support the MTA. We are not able to support to file an amicus right. because of our status as government agency, right. but there are a lot of other organizations led by the Environmental Defense Fund that will be signed on. Um, the other threat, and I think is really substantial, comes from uh, an, an amendment that was filed by uh, Josh Donheimer and his uh, colleagues on the other side of the river, river uh, who uh, attached language to the transportation and, and housing and urban development uh, appropriation bill that would um, disallow the, would prohibit implementation of congestion pricing until the EIS is completed and released. And that's Amendment Number 40 and Amendment 41 would prohibit the MTA from spending any money on the appropriations bill so, uh, unless New Jersey drivers entering the CBD were exempt from paying the full toll. So, uh, Representative Nadler and uh, Goldman have uh, written a counter bill, uh, a counter appropriations uh, language amendment to strike that language. Uh, they are seeking. Uh, uh, 
co-signers of that amendment, um, and asking our colleagues in advocacy uh, and our and to and we're extending that to ask you all to reach out to uh, certain targeted elected officials to ask them to join that uh, as on as co-signers. And um, with your permission, we'd like to send you the information um, about what this about what the the the, the does the benefits and consequences support a congestion process. But this would this helps to sort of lay it out. The just points about the appropriation of rest and also the uh, the threat the, the specific threat of what could happen if congestion prices were forward and the names of the elected officials and their contact information that we're asking people to reach out. Pretty ironic, considering New Jersey just agreed to raise the tolls on the New Jersey Turnpike and the Garden State Parkway. Mm -hmm. How is that different? Um, Andrew, Lisa, uh, a couple of things. First of all, it might be useful. I got a copy of this from both Goldman's and Adler's office. I'm regularly in contact with them. To send everybody the whole amendment so they can see it. But it's very it's detailed. And I mean, I don't know if anybody gets their kicks out of reading amendments to <laughs> Congress, but it, it, it's really, really yeah. interesting the way they're approaching it. I'm not going to go into all the details. But there is the important thing is to get some of our out of city, especially the Long Island, the four Long Island, excuse me, I'm going to be, well, they are, they call themselves the four Long Island Republicans. And I don't think you're going to be able to get Santos to do anything, because right now they're trying to expel him, so I don't know what he's going to do. But at least the other three Long Island Republicans to sign on, because it does affect the Long Island Railroad, it does affect their constituents. But that's, those are the ones who should be approached more than anything. So um, if you can send out a copy of that, of the Nadler-Goldman Amendment. We'll send, we'll send everything that we've got. The other, um, in particular, we were asked to ask people to reach out to Grace Meng's office. Um, She's okay. Uh, as, as a co-signer um, uh, uh, for the amendment. Oh, okay. Well, for the, well I, I, I could. I, the more uh, names, or the better. Queen, who is our Queen, our Queen's representative? Should be. They should be, but they're, and, and Greg me. so there should be, but they're not. So to get them on. Uh, so who, those are the, the city work Members of Congress are Greg Meeks and Grace May. Have there's, there's more. I'll send it to you. Can you send that to me? Because I, I yeah, don't know how to get it. We're going to send it to yeah, everybody. Yeah, I'll send it to everybody. Yeah. Yeah. But Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Uh, question? Yes. Uh, in that, uh, at the last meeting I saw, and I know I spoke to Q on this, and right now Q is at the doctor right now, so and he's fine, Jimmy. Um, oh, I got uh, No, 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 he's fine. Let me just focus on China Uh He definitely agrees that we need to make sure that accessibility and information goes out because the community and the way the news media is saying, they're talking about congestion price, but a lot of people are, this is what politicians are going to say, are they concerned about seniors and disability? That's the thing they're going to be, you know, may ask us that question. Do we have a answer to what we should be saying or what should we not there's, say? There's a whole list of things that will not, that could potentially not happen without congestion pricing money. Yeah, and accessibility is one of them. It's key. Yep. Making 495% of the 472 stations accessible costs billions of dollars and we must be paid for with congestion pricing. Another, another big project. And then the subway extension that Senator Schumer just announced yeah. $3.4 billion. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that, um, yeah. It's a big push and pull at a time when we expect, uh, I think November 29th uh, is the date of the next board meeting, so. uh, and that we expect there to be developed. Yeah, that's, yeah, it can't go. You can't, obviously. Yeah, but, but Andrew, there is a problem on the TMRB, especially between. Uh, John Samuelson and um, um, other, you know, who are not union people. And unless they resolve that, no matter how many letters we write, no matter how many anything. So, do you have any sense of what's going on with that? Because I know you and Samuelson are very close. Yeah, 
They don't. They don't have to make a unanimous recommendation. No, they don't. They have to make a recommendation to the MTA board, which then right, but then makes a determination. Yeah, but I understand that. But because of the, you know, if I know about the yeah. the, the people a lot more important and a lot more plugged in than me. And all I'm saying is, is that, that while the TMRB is is it gives the outside people who are against congestion pricing more ammunition because they're saying not even the TMRB can agree on this these these things. So I don't know if you've had it's, any it's, contact. It's I'm up to the MTA you, board. At the but have you had any? I understand, but have you had any contact with with John Samuelson? Not, on this? not no. recently. No, I attended the last uh, TMRB meeting so I could see the dynamics and the people screaming in the audience and being taken out no, by I watch it online, security so I, I, and all of that. So yeah. I wanted to see that, yes. <laughs> um, Mr. X has a, had a question, and then Stuart, yeah. Capital initiatives, how would her district 
benefit from this, uh, you, you know, because of all the, all the nuances about parking, and, and certainly Borelli continues the line of um, discourse about how Staten Islanders would use. Uh, yes, absolutely. You know, um, so the, the, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> the, 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 the Port Authority can't use this issue was um, there were a number of the local electeds over by the Port Authority and Community Board 4 wrote a letter to the Port Authority and said, what are you doing? You are, you know, you're, because of your lack of um, willingness to let us put the candies up by the, by the tunnel, they're forcing them to put the, the places, architect, there's this infrastructure on streets that in some cases are quasi-historic uh, by buildings that are so, I don't know if it was by design, but the keynote speaker was the executive director of the Port Authority, but he was the first panel early in the morning. <laughs> this was the very last panel, uh, you know, in three, three something. And, and that also and presents so, another problem. But they felt they were taking. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, that pre yeah. presents another problem, which is they could have designated a route from the West Side Highway, uh, keeping you just in a certain path right into the Lincoln Tunnel, and then you wouldn't have been hit with the congestion charge if, if you were doing that, uh, and they chose not to do that. They could have similar, similarly done that from coming through the Hugh Carey Tunnel and exiting through the Holland Tunnel. If they kept you on a specific route, you wouldn't have been adding to the general, you know, malaise of congestion if they kept you on a route who and you exited, the exited the island right away. And who is the they? The they is the Port Authority not allowing, well, it's not them who would have designated the route. They don't route, designate the route, do But they? the TMRB hasn't uh, even, in, even suggested such a route, which I thought was going to be part of the... And, and the way yeah. Wait, wait a minute. Uh, just to clarify, it's the TMRB that makes the route, not the... It's whole... No, 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 but he's talking about the route. I'm talking about a confined route that would allow people to make a simple movement through the tunnels without affecting the whole island of Manhattan and getting credit for that. So but that is the TMRB that will designate the Ultimately the, the MTA. No, but the TMRB will suggest to the MTA. I don't know that they will suggest routes. They will suggest the fees and exemptions. I think, you know, and the last takeaway was that you know, that certain categories should still be exempt or looked at very carefully, like um, for higher drivers and uh, no. especially if they're going to be required to have electric vehicles. Yeah, that's a whole nother. That's covered. Right. That's a whole nother. That's an entire day. Right. Right. <laughs> oh, let me go on. I'll keep it at that. Sorry. Oh, oh, he's doing it remotely? Oh, oh, okay. But let's do it. Hi, Sean. Hello. Hi there. Hi. You're welcome to come and to uh, join us if you like. Uh, thank you. Sorry, there was a bit of a calendar mix-up, so I, I'm, I, as soon as I realized I was late, I jumped on. Uh, so here I am. Probably the easiest. Here you are. Great. Am, am I meant to just get into it then? Apologies. I'm, I'm catching up here. state of good repair versus expansion of the system, all of those issues we've also talked about. But please, let's hear. Excellent. Well, well, I'm happy to run through our sort of standard deck uh, just to sort of, uh, sort of um, shape the conversation, if that's helpful. Is that, is that sort of useful? Okay, great. Okay, I'll, I'll run through it quickly, although I do need permission to share the screen, uh, if that is possible. Um. 
Okay, yep, I'm in. Give me one moment. Get it fired up. All right. Can folks see uh, see my screen here? Excellent. Well, thank you so much for, for making the time. We're very excited, very proud to talk about this 20-year needs assessment. Um, I, I'll, I'll run through this very quickly and you know, sort of leave time to answer a couple questions. But um, I think folks by now probably know what, what our 20-year needs assessment is. It's a legislatively mandated long-term look at the needs of the entire MTA system. Um, and we, you know, we think we've done a very comprehensive job looking at, um, you know, everything that the system needs in order to, you know, maintain service over the course of uh, the next generation. You know, we, this comes at a time when the MTA system is, you know, really bouncing back from COVID and there's a lot of reason for optimism. You know, we've got great uh, performance stats that our operating agencies are pulling in um, from month to month and we're, you know, we, we're very proud of that. At the same time, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of work that needs to happen. And that's, uh, you know, both things that are really visible for our customers. Um, you know, we have examples of the Canal Street Station, for instance, where you can tell that there's work that needs to be done, um, as well as things that customers don't see. You know, some of our bus depots, some of our back of house facilities, substations, things you'll never notice uh, riding the system, but that are really essential to its operation and, you know, need significant amounts of work uh, in order to, um, you know, not, ha not have us fall behind. We're also facing um, you know, some real inflection points in the uh, sort of in the system that require you know action in order to address them. Our infrastructure is aging, and it's not it's it's only time is only running in one direction. When the MTA capital program started in the '80s, we had a lot of assets that were you know middle aged that are quite old now, and you know reaching that point where they're 100 years old, 100 plus years old and need to be comprehensively reconstructed in order to not have increasing challenges. Climate change, I probably don't need to sort of, you know, the last, the month we've had, I don't need to describe to anybody the challenges of climate change, but clearly the intensity of storms, um, you know, and then the attendant challenges, the heat over the course of the summer, increasing winter storms. I mean, it's there's a lot of climate change challenges that need to be faced directly the system wasn't designed to deal with any of these sort of uh, changes in the intensity of extreme weather events. Um, and our riders themselves are changing. You know, the advent of remote work has meant that a lot of workers now have a choice whether they are riding or not. Um, and, and even even beyond that, you know, the advent of the cell phone and, you know, folks have an expectation of kind of up to the second frictionless uh, travel information. And we need to provide that and we need to be able to you know, sort of have a smooth, comfortable ride or else folks are not gonna return to the system in the way that we need them to. Um, so all of that leads us together to three sets of priorities. The, the first and most sort of fundamental is we need to rebuild the foundations of the existing system. That's to ensure that it we literally can continue to provide service. We need to improve our network to meet the needs of the 21st century. You know, that's you know, everything from our accessibility program to addressing some of those climate change challenges that I talked about. And then to the extent that we're able to, uh, you know, successfully rebuild and improve the system in the way it needs, you know, we're, we're, you know, obviously there's opportunities for expansion that also need to be looked at and we need to figure out what are the smartest, most cost-effective means of expanding the system as we move forward. So I'll run through a few highlights of the sort of rebuild uh, category. You know, we looked at in the course of this process nearly six million individual assets, from you know individual uh, components in a substation to you know miles of line structure and you know just a motley crew of uh, of different things looked at across all the different MTA agencies, um, including you know eighty seven hundred rail cars, six thousand buses, a thousand rail bridges. I mean, it's it's a pretty incredible assortment of infrastructure that we need to you know every single element of it is essential for our system to operate. Um, we examine the condition of each of those assets. So uh, this is through inspections and other um, sort of modeling to look at deterioration. Um, and we looked at whether things were, you know, a standard on a standardized scale that's based on what the FTA, Federal Transit Administration, uh, calls for. Um, 
if we looked at the condition from one being poor all the way to five being excellent. And what the 20 year needs assessment shows you is everything, you know, how many we have of each of these different types of assets and how many are in poor and marginal condition, which is to say, which are the ones that need uh, work in the next 20 year period sort of with, based on their condition today. Uh, here's an example just to show you what uh, the, those inspections yield. Uh, this is station platforms. This is sort of the underside of a station platform that clearly, this one has already been addressed, but it's a before picture, uh, clearly is in sort of poor condition, needs to be fixed. Um, and then you have things that are sort of adequate, uh, like the one in the middle here. You can tell that, you know, it's not uh, not brand new, but it's still structurally sound and is not a safety hazard in any way. Um, not that one and two necessarily means it's a safety hazard. There's sort of a, that's a separate process that gets dealt with on an emergency basis. But, uh, and then four and five, you know, obviously after we complete a, you know, station renewal, um, you know, the platforms look, uh, you know, sparkling. You could eat off them, although we'd still have advised strongly against that. Um, so example, e examples of the, um, examples of the type of uh, work that falls in to the, um, uh, this rebuild category, you know, at transits power for New York City transit, you know, there's an incredible need uh, to address our power system by 2045. So at the end of this 20 year cycle, uh, more than three quarters of components in our in our power substations would be more than 50 years old. So we need to get ahead of that and, you know, not have sort of power failures lead to delays. Um, our signal system, you know, CBTC is really, really critical, both because of the benefits that it provides uh, and the ability to run trains more quickly and closer together, but also to address the state of good repair needs of the existing uh, signal system, which is, you know, in many cases, um, you know, dates back to the 1930s and is increasingly prone to failure. Um, and our shops and yards has been a real sort of point of emphasis in this document. Um, you know, you've heard Chair Lieber talk about going out to Livonia Yard, which is pictured here on the right, um, where literally it's just it was it's you know 101 years old and literally was not designed to fit modern. Obviously, was not designed to fit modern rail cars. And so the reason the three train, uh, you know, rolling stock has not been modernized is in large part because we don't have space to you know store and repair uh, those cars um, because the the shop that serves the three train. Um, you know, doesn't it, this, the literal clearances are not high enough to sort of get on top of to repair the you know air conditioning units and other sort of equipment that's on top of modern train cars. So it desperately needs work is a, is going to be a real priority um, going forward. Um, for Metro North, you know, one of the main things that we've talked about is the the Grand Central Artery. Um, you know, that sort of uh, running from uh, you know Grand Central itself through the Grand Central train shed up the Park Avenue tunnel, up to the Park Avenue viaduct. Obviously you've probably heard us talk about the Park Avenue viaduct work that is you know, underway and that we're very excited about, but that whole spine of the, of the Metro North system that 98% of Metro North customers travel on um, is, in, in need, is more than hundred years old and is in need of reconstruction. We've been for a long time doing priority repairs to the train shed, um, but the sort of we're reaching a sort of a breaking point where we can't keep up with the repair needs. It needs to be comprehensively reconstructed. Um, stations themselves, uh, especially on the Harlem line, uh, there you, know, you see examples of uh, stations that were you know sort of modernized when Metro North was created in the 1980s, but it's been 40 years. And the um, you know, we just celebrated the 40th anniversary, in fact. And, you know, work needs to be done to keep stations and you see an example here of a, a platform that's being supported sort of in an improvised way by wood uh which is clearly not the long-term solution so there's a lot of work that needs to be done for metro north stations long island railroads priorities include structures um you know both sort of the types of above grade infrastructure shown here where there's you know again you're gonna hear me say it probably several more times before my you know five minutes is up here um more than 100 years old, a lot of the Long Island Railroad structures in desperate need of work. The Atlantic Avenue Tunnel, in addition, in Brooklyn, uh, is a is also more than 100 years old and in need of in need you know, hasn't been substantively reconstructed since then. Um, there's also a need to continue to modernize the signal system and you know sort of establish 
full um, train control, uh, a positive train control for LIRR. Um, and across the sort of rail agencies, fleet renewal is uh, is another thing that we need to continue to keep up with. Um, you know, we have uh, obviously uh, trains get, you know, some of these, the R68s were sort of the first heralding of the uh, MTA capital program and the promise that it had. They were, you know, dramatically more reliable than their predecessors. But as they get older, they've become less reliable. And crucially, the new rolling stock we brought in is even more reliable. So in order to keep sort of trains running, we need to have a constant stream of new rolling stock to, um, you know, take advantage of the uh, you know advances that have been made, as well as retire uh, trains as they sort of reach the limits of their sort of useful life and start to have more frequent reliability issues. So, and for bridges and tunnels, um, you know, it's sort of keeping up the good work. They obviously keep their bridges and tunnels in an incredible state of good repair, thanks to the sort of tireless work that they do. And, you know, there's things like, you know, deck replacement and preserving the cables uh, that we're going to need to keep up with over the course of the next 20 years to stay ahead of the curve for bridges and tunnels. So the improve category, we're talking about um, things like accessibility um, sort of fits in that, you know, it's sort of retrofitting the existing system to make it accessible. Um, you know, obviously, we're, we remain committed to the historic um, uh, commitment that was made last year as part of the settlement to um, you know, reach 95% of subway stations by 2055. Um, what we're sort of, we did the math and projected out that by 2045, we'll have hit 90% of riders being served um, at in the subway system at, by stations that are accessible. We also, for the first time, put together a, a new commitment to get to 95% of full-time commuter rail stations by 2045. Um, so that sort of, you know, builds on the momentum that I think has been made during this capital program for for Long Island, especially and for Metro North as well. Um, you know, for climate, uh, there's sort of both sustainability and resilience uh, are, are priorities on the sustainability front. You know, the most important thing we can do is continue to grow our ridership. Um, you know, today the MTA helps avert more than 20 million metric tons of carbon every year, and you know we that that's it's only going to be more important that we continue to attract riders and you know have them take advantage of the low carbon um, uh, transit that we offer. And we're also gonna reduce our own operational emissions as, we talked, as we've talked about previously. Uh, we have the opportunity to reduce our own emissions by 85% by 2040 um, through things like bus electrification. Um, you know, resilience, you, you maybe heard at the board yesterday, uh, you know, another kind of uh, summation of some of our work on the resilience front, but we're gonna need to continue to confront challenges like flash flooding, um, coastal storms, sea level rise, heat, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of work to do through, you know, really significant capital projects to keep the system running. And we're going to, we've sort of have space here to continue to innovate. We didn't have sort of in 2045, we'll be using X technology, but we're going to need to continue to make space for things like, um, you know, uh, use of um, new technologies to make our system even better. So this is a, this is, we think there's both a, a threat that we sort of face as well as a positive vision for what the future can be. Um, if we, if we ignore these threats, you know, we think the system run, you know, despite the progress we've made, the system runs the risk of, you know, running into real challenges or, and sort of returning to uh, some of the things that we thought we'd banished uh, to the bad old days. Um, but if we face these challenges, it's not just going to be preserving the system we have today. We have the opportunity to make it, you know, even better. And so we're very excited about that. And then I'll, I'll just, on the expand front, I'll just talk real quickly. We looked at a lot of different potential investments, um, you know, looked at them through the lens of these different uh, criteria. Um, it's sort of all available on the MTA, uh, on our page yes. here. Got, you know, details on the different metrics that we looked at. Each project then was about, you know, has a scorecard showing what its results were from the analysis of cost, ridership, um, you know, environmental benefits, things of that nature. And, you know, this is the the big board, so to speak, of the results, you know, arranged alphabetically. This is the start of a conversation, not the end of one, but showing, um, you know, sort of what what sort of a project looks like from a cost effectiveness perspective and how it, it measures up on all these different metrics. Again, though, the, the sort of the punchline on expansion from our perspective really is, you know, really interesting. It's always exciting for folks to talk about these projects and think about them. It, this is it's really an academic exercise unless we're in a position to meet our rebuild and improve uh, needs. Um, 
yeah, we just we can't be expanding the system in order to, um, you know, if, if it's not going to be connecting into a, a system that's strong in and of itself. Um, you know, even the IBX, which I just mentioned, you know, one of the IBX is key or which, which the previous slide showed. Um, one of the Interborough Express's key benefits is that it connects to up to 17 other subway lines in the Long Island Railroad. Well, if those other if those other subway lines are not running good service, it's a pretty limited value to be able to connect to them. So, um, you know, this is uh, from our perspective, this is a really natural follow up to the uh, historic investment that the governor and the state legislature made this year on the operating budget and the ability of us to you know, make, continue to run full service. Um, and in fact, even increased service. It's that's only half the equation, though. We need to make sure that the capital side keeps up so that we can, you know, sustain that, that level of service that our operating agencies have been providing, you know, so so with such excellent success recently. Um, and it's also, you know, comes at a time when we're going to continue to deliver the actual capital program better, faster, and cheaper, which I know you've heard me and others talk about many times before. But we don't want to lose sight of the fact that it's not just about throwing money at these issues. It's about you know, sort of addressing them in as smart and sort of thoughtful a way as possible. So you can look at the full plan, including appendices that have a ton of detail for each agency and you know all the all the um, stats and figures on the expansion side as well at future.mta.info. Really encourage you to you know spend some time there. And with that, I'm happy to answer a few questions. Thank you. Anyone have questions? I have a question for Sean. This is a fantastic report. I'm just curious as to what kind of manpower did you use to put this together? Where do you get all the information from and how do you assemble it? It's a it's a great question. So it, this this report is in large part a result of the creation of MTA construction and development and specifically the planning department within it. Um, so under the leadership of Frederica Cuenca, um, and you know, a sort of uh, a small but mighty team uh, was assembled that looked at the, um, you know, looked at all sorts of data, you know, from working in really close partnership with our operating agencies and with the folks who are sort of managing these assets on a day-to-day -day basis, as well as you know, additional sort of resources that that sort of the C and D team brought to bear on the capital side to pull together you know, all of this data and then look at its themes in order to come up with sort of the priorities that we outlined. So, but it's it's a direct result of you know, previous 20 year needs assessments and there hadn't been one that was released in you know, a, a decade. Um, uh, previous 20 year needs assessments were done sort of as a exercise sort of in isolation, each agency coming up with you know, kind of what they thought their priorities might be. Um, you know, this was a really comprehensive look that you know, drew on the expertise of C&D as an entity, as well as you know, all the folks across the agencies. Uh, and we, we're, we're very proud of the result. One follow up, did any of this get done by outside consultants or was this done completely inside? You know, we had a we had a consultant on board who helped with some of the organizing and the sort of graphic design side of it. But it, this was a this was a you know uh, overwhelmingly in-house effort um, sort of between the MTA agencies. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Great presentation. Uh, great document. But you mentioned the uh, prior plans that were from a decade ago. Were there any projects that um, were not accomplished? or still remain uh, that are identified still as priorities that you want to flag for us? You know, I, I think that there's a, um, what this what this uh, document isn't is sort of a, a list of projects for prioritization. You know, it's sort of a, it's a, it's a description of what the needs are and sort of on a programmatic level, what needs to be done. Um, so I think that was sort of a shift from some of the ways that previous uh, documents were put together. There's always, you know, I, the, every one of these documents says that you need to do more to address state of good repair um, and keep up with normal replacement. Um, so that that theme hasn't changed very much, but we think we have a um, more detailed and rigorous sort of analysis of exactly what that means. And that's, I think, the biggest sort of difference. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, before you came on board, we, we discussed congestion pricing and the, the, the money that might come from that. In your 
putting out all of these priorities. So did you take the cost into consideration as you rated them and the feasibility of doing them with the kind of money that we have now as opposed to the kind of money that we hope will come in? Well, so certainly, I mean, congestion pricing, obviously, is, as I'm sure this group appreciates better than, you know, the everybody in sort of in the public discussion, um, you know, funds this current capital program. And if there were to be, you know, substantial delays or challenges to that money, it would clearly impact our ability to deliver this current capital program, which would which would mean that there's even greater needs sort of that are identified in this document. One thing that this document did that was a little different uh, or another sort of difference in the way we sort of conceptualized it is that it you, you'll find that it doesn't, with the exception of the expansion projects, which sort of need a cost benefit analysis to you know sort of consider them in their own right. Um, we don't have sort of a, a list of dollar figures associated with uh, these projects. Previous um, examples, um, you know, sort of emphasize, you know, sort of started with a dollar figure, and there was a little bit of working backwards from what seemed reasonable. What we've done here is just laid out, here's what the needs are, period. And, you know, we'll have to work together to figure out how to, you know, sort of meet as many of them as possible with the resources that are ultimately made available. But we, this is sort of an honest look that doesn't constrain ourselves before we get into that process. It, it tells you what the full story is in terms of need. If I may, then you're saying that you, in doing this, is there another group or a part of your group or will there be that will be looking at a cost benefit analysis and seeing where where the money can come from and if if it doesn't come, how many of these projects will still be able to occur? Yeah, it's it's a um, it's certainly the the C and D along with the sort of rest of the MTA family is already sort of you know this document was published and we're already hard at work starting to think about how to put together the. Uh, 25 to 29 capital program, which, uh, you know, sort of due to the public and to the um, to the relevant stakeholders uh, next fall. Uh, so we have sort of a year uh, to go on that front. Um, you know, I, I think cost benefit is, a, is an interest, you know, it's clearly a, a really important tool from a um, from a sort of especially on the sort of expansion side where you're deciding between different priorities in terms of what would be nice to have versus what would have the biggest impact. Um, the one thing I'd note though is that it's hard to do cost benefit when it comes to these sort of basic state of good repair needs. You know, the question of do you is what's the better cost benefit? Is it fixing the power system or fixing the signal system? If you want your trains to run reliably, you you just need to do both. It's not really a sort of matter of um, of sort of choosing a priority between them. And so that's what we've tried to do is set the stage for what needs to be done. And, you know, we'll we'll have to work collectively to figure out how to best address those needs. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, Karen, and then Chris, and then Mr. X, and then I'll ask the final question. Well, thank you for your presentation. I know you stated that you don't have costs. I'm curious, because you talk about the system that we have versus the system we could have if we do these things. I'm sorry. I'm having a I'm having a hard time hearing. Oh, raise your voice a little bit. Oh, okay. Can you hear me better now? That's a little better. Yep. A little better. Uh, raise your voice. Just raise your voice. Yeah, you're talking very well. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was curious as to if you talk about the cost, not so much in dollars, but what happens if we delay certain things and what things might be safe to delay um, versus others. So is there some, I know you don't do prioritize, but sometimes when we think about the cost, there are very few things that get cheaper over time, some things that will, and also how it can affect um, other things. So like, what do you want to say, a domino effect? So I just want to know how, if you at all, get into any of those types of discussions. Yeah, I, th I think it's a really important, it's, it's a really important point and one that is going to be very central to the way we think about the creation of this next five-year plan that'll be happening over the course of the next year. Now that we have this framework of sort of what are all the needs that the system has, CND, another central reason that CND was created is in order to figure out how to deliver the program as efficiently and as cost effectively as possible. That's You've heard us talk about things like bundling projects together, you know, to take advantage of um, 
you know, if there's going to be, if you're going to need to close a line in order to do project X, well, then you should also do projects Y and Z that require that same closure at the same mm -hmm. time. Um, and so we're going to be working very closely, you know, both our planning group that I mentioned earlier, as well as our development group, uh, to figure out how to, you know, create the most you know, sort of nimble and effective program possible to take it, you know, the greatest advantage of um, the scarce resources we have, which is money is is going to be one of them, but time is another is another really important one, um, especially outage time, which is you know so important to getting construction done while running you know the largest transit system in the country. Yeah, I don't think this is around. Uh, Chris, you were next. Yeah, um, first I would like to say that are we talking? Okay, um, I'm glad to see that we've been discussing about accessibility, you know, with elevators and sometimes more ramps. Um, I just hope to see that what things that we did accomplish in the past and then we're accomplishing in the future, we can see that more in the 20 year plan. A lot of our advocates are ha happy to see what we've been doing, but at the same time, um, I see you doing history a little bit, because I'm looking on the website right now, and we need to see that a little bit on the accessibility. I see in the past what they showed what was and what is now. We need to sometimes show that on the what stations are accessible or where, where the MTA has been working on. So can we try that in the future or something it's, it's a great point. When you go into the document itself, um, there is sort of an, a, a case study on accessibility um, that, you know, I think gets into it in a little bit more detail, some of the some of the history of it, as well as what some of the, you know, challenges that we've overcome in order to deliver the projects. But it's a, it's a great suggestion that I'm, you know, we will try to emphasize, you know, even more so in the future. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm going to wrap this up with a question, Sean. Um, as the official riders group, there are some projects that we have championed that I do not see listed in the list of projects. How do we get our ideas for projects? And there are several really good ones that I think would benefit the MTA in a lot of ways. How do we get them onto the list of proposed projects? You're, you're talking in terms of expansion projects, Andrew? Um, it's not an expansion. It might be a connection uh, of, of various lines that are, uh, you know, crossing each other. I will use the renovation of the East New York Long Island Railroad Station with the internal connection to the Atlantic Avenue L line, much as we have done at uh, Livonia Junius, you know, combining those two, giving an inside connection. Uh, both can use the work and would benefit from a connection, plus there's some other lines that we have championed that should be connected or, or extended. So how do we get our feelings into this? Yeah, it's it's a great suggestion, and, and I'm happy to work with Lisa and the team to figure out what the right sort of um, uh, mechanism is for sort of getting that feedback to us. I think it's really valuable. I think it's I think it's especially valuable in the context of this creation of the next plan, right? Again, this isn't right. part, you're not gonna see you know, East New York Station, for instance, is a priority that, you know, is something that we are looking at in the context of the next plan. Um, you know, we don't have a list of which stations are for the next plan because we're not at that stage just yet. But I think this is exactly the right time to start to flag some of those things and make sure that, you know, they're getting full consideration. Um, so exactly what format or whatever, we'll, we'll you know, happy to work out um, with the team. But I, I think it's it's exactly the right moment to be raising those types of priorities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ron, we see your hand up in, in this direction. We know you have, we have your hand as well, but we also have a one-clock station that we're a little late for. And we have our presenter on. Um, so if you want to send me your questions, I'll send them to Sean. And we will get you answers. And we'll get you answers. Happy to do it that way. Yep. Thank you so Thank very you, much. Thank you, Sean. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Take care, all. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Sunil, for being patient. And, uh, far over. Sunil, you're on. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, great, great. Yeah. Um, Zafira or Jake, do you want to put up the slides?
Jake, do you want to put up the slides? I don't have them. Can we give Zafira screen access? Sorry? Zafira was going to screen share for you. Can we make sure she has the permissions? Can you see, can you see it? We're trying to put it up now. Give okay. us one second. Yeah. Hold on one second. Uh, there we go. Okay, good. Great. Thank you. Great. Okay. Did you? Thank you. And uh, I guess everybody can see this now. Well, uh, firstly, my name is Sunil Nair. I work in the Department of Buses. I look after multiple bus technology projects, as well as the zero emissions uh, fleet transformation uh, project. And uh, I wanted to thank the PCAC for inviting me here for uh, talking about two uh, kind of primary initiatives that we have going on in the Department of Buses. I'll quickly talk through uh, the buses overview, uh, what we are doing in the automated camera enforcement space, uh, where we have reached in the project and what our next steps are, and then a quick spotlight on uh, zero emissions and uh, what are the criteria, the opportunities and challenges with respect to zero emissions. Uh, next slide. Thank you. So at, at a high level, I'm sure most of you know about this, but at a high level, we have 5,800 buses across uh, 331 routes running out of 28 depots and five boroughs. 18, 000, a little over, a little less than 19,000 employees. So, uh, and you have the capital and operating budgets right there, but I'm sure you've seen this. Uh, so this is just a quick recap. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, this is a snapshot of the buses fleet itself. Uh, across buses, we have a little over a thousand express coach buses, which is 45 feet buses. Uh, a little over 1,100 60-foot articulated buses and the remaining standard 40-foot buses. Um, on a propulsion basis, we have a mixed propulsion fleet, and which is actually a good thing because it gives us uh, flexibility in terms of operations. Uh, right now, the express fleet is all clean diesel, uh, and we are prioritizing parts of the express fleet for conversion to a zero emissions basis. Articulated is a mixture of uh, compressed natural gas and clean diesel and standards are a mixture of uh, compressed natural gas, hybrid electric buses, and clean diesel. So that's kind of a overall uh, snapshot. Uh, this is an important slide for me because it shows how important uh, buses are to the equity uh, considerations in the city. In the words of our chairman, uh, buses remain an engine of equity across uh, New York City. And as that uh, chart on the left hand shows, among low and minority neighborhoods, low income and minority neighborhoods, buses served a large, larger percentage of customers than all the other modes of transportation combined, which means that we are the ones who take the most care of uh, minority populations across the city, as well as you know, low income populations across the city. So buses being here is critical and any investment in buses is super critical to our communities who need them. Well, you know, we have our challenges too. Uh, right now, we are recovering from uh, the post-COVID uh, ridership uh, issues that we've seen. Uh, right, right after COVID, we saw a pretty tumultuous drop in ridership, approximately 20%. Uh, we reached 20% we reached of ridership uh, pre-COVID, uh, right as uh, uh, COVID came around. It slowly inched back up. We got up to 65% uh, when fares were suspended. But then as soon as fares was resumed, uh, ridership dropped again. Right now, we are at about 65% of pre-COVID ridership. And uh, we aim to get back to normal levels, but it's it's a challenge, you know? And the second challenge is really uh, fare evasion. Right now, fare evasion has increased to over 40% in this year. We lost approximately 315 million to fare evasion last year and we expect higher losses this year. So this is a clear and present problem. That said, I wanna say that between paid and unpaid ridership, we are pretty high. We are carrying a lot of people. Um, in fact, it's up to 80% of pre-COVID levels, which means that once we get ridership back up and we tackle the rising fare evasion issues, we should be in a much better position than before. That's not stopping us from doing a lot of important work that's necessary in terms of making our service faster. What we did over the course of this year 
was really we, we looked at all the underperforming routes across all five boroughs. And using targeted criteria, we used uh, criteria like, like customer journey time performance, customer satisfaction as reported in the customer satisfaction survey, ridership as, as a basis, a service delivered as a basis, and using weighted metrics against each of these, these criteria, we developed a list of routes across all five boroughs that need close attention and close kind of an action plan so that you can bring service back up for these uh, really low performing routes. So we, we identified 29 priority routes that needed to be looked at. And the good part is we worked across multiple uh, parts of the agency. We worked across dispatchers and making sure that they dispatch buses on a much more um, uh, uh, regular basis based on time points and things like that. We worked with schedules, depot operations, personnel were deployed out in the streets. We worked with uh, NYPD, MTA PD. And the good part is uh, this is actually yielding results. 22 of the 29 routes that we identified increased customer satisfaction by an approximate, uh, by, by an average of about 8% over uh, uh, the basis. So that itself is a, a, a really encouraging bit of news in terms of bringing service back to um, normal levels. And this is, we're not stopping here. We are going to continue to work on this and make sure that we, you know, identi keep identifying these priority routes and make them better as we start to, uh, you know, expand our service um, post COVID. Another aspect of making sure that we get better service to our customers and getting ridership back is really working with city DOT on expanding bus lanes and busways across the city. Bus lanes and busways are critical to moving our buses on a faster, more reliable basis across the city. And 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 DOT is really working with us. And over the last you know six to eight years, the number of bus lanes has increased to a total of 164 total miles, with 14 miles planned for this year. And and we are seeing these success stories right away on on Main Street busway. We saw PM peak speeds improve by 50 percent once the busway was instituted. 181st Street, 32%. And the most recent busway, Jamaica Avenue, 34%. So we are actually seeing these results right, right away, working with City DOT. And what, what more do we do, you know, in terms of technology? How do we use technology to really uh, improve our service? And this is where, you know, automated camera enforcement comes to comes to play. Um, I want to say I want to say that automated camera enforcement is really a smart camera that is installed on buses that automatically issues tickets to violators as the bus senses violators in buses bus lanes. This was implemented. We started implementation in October of 2020, 2019. We have 500 buses across 21 routes right now, and we we are expanding this to a, about a thousand buses over the course of next year. The fines themselves are worked out with city DOT under, under DOT laws uh, and rules. Uh, and the fines begin at $50 with escalating each time by another 50 up to a cap of $250. Of course, some vehicles are exempt. Emergency vehicles, uh, diplomats, garbage trucks, and things like that are exempt. But the majority of the tickets go to actual lane violators who are in our bus lanes impeding, impeding our buses. The system itself, uh, um, I'm, I'm very proud to say that the system integrates uh, multiple stakeholders and agencies in a, in, a, in a fairly automated manner. Our buses capture the violation automatically. There is no operator in involvement. There is nothing. The bus knows where it is and, and captures these violations on uh, uh, per business rules built into the bus. Uh, City DOT automatically receives the violations and reviews the violations and makes sure that the violations are a proper legitimate violation. Um, and then of course they send out notice of liabilities to, to the motorists. The motorists who have blocked our bus lanes get about, about 30 days to respond. Department of Finance is also involved uh, where they actually receive the, the, the uh, amounts uh, or the fine amounts from the motorists. They process the fine amounts. They perform all the adjudication that's necessary culminating in, in the fines collected back to the MTA net of any processing fees that are due to DOT and DOF. So long story short, multiple agencies with very minimal paper transactions between agencies on an automated basis makes this a, a unique project. 
the the project itself includes elements of artificial intelligence built on the buses that make for accurate determination of what is a violation and exactly where the violation has happened. The camera itself is fairly sophisticated in terms of identifying various parts of the street that actually um, uh, contextualizes the street for the camera better and for the bus better, right? So here in this image, you can see that the camera has actually identified various parts of the traffic space in front of it, and it knows exactly what which uh, entity is doing what in the in the, in the in the in the space in front of it. Uh, it includes you know things like lane line geometry, license um, artificial intelligence based license plate recognition a spatial awareness of exactly where the bus is in the lane, because that's critical. You have to be in the lane to uh, you know, issue a ticket appropriately. And then of course, additional data semantics that sit on top of your regular data that gives the bus, gives the bus, gives the camera and gives the system that much more uh, awareness and accuracy in terms of the, uh, in terms of the tickets uh, that's been deployed or are issued. Um, here are some high-level stats. Uh, what we've noticed as a result of uh, bus lane uh, uh, enforcement is that we saw 5% average speed increase on those lanes that are enforced, which is which is actually a, a, a large large amount. I mean, and I'm so proud of that. 20% uh, reduction in collisions. That's that's a, that's, a, that's another big one because it it shows that it's not just making our buses faster; it's making our roadways safer for New Yorkers. And approximately half a million customers are benefiting from the routes that we have um, um, uh, automated camera enforcement on. The other point that we that I would love to make is the recidivism. That means the proclivity of a, a violator to commit the violation again and again is actually low, which means that the message that MTA is performing, MTA and the city agencies are performing, lane enforcement is getting out there which means 92% of the people who get it, get the first ticket do not commit that offense again, which means the message is getting out, our lanes are getting clearer, and, 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 the, and the objective of all of this is not really to you know, make money, it's to make sure that our lanes are clear. So I think it's functioning well on multiple metrics that we have used to measure the system. So this is where we are with respect to overall uh, 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 status. Uh, we have deployed it on 20 routes right now or across all five boroughs, uh, about 80 miles of bus lanes, which is about 50% of the total bus lanes we have, uh, which means there is a lot of uh, 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 potential for uh, additional expansion. Uh, we've mailed out approximately 328,000 violations and uh, we have collected uh, approximately $15 million in the General Transportation Fund. That's, uh, that's, in the, that's with the MTA. Uh, the, the graphs actually show you exactly the distribution of tickets by route and things like that. I don't want to go into that kind of detail, but at a high level, these are your stats uh, so that you have it right there. Well, um, I talked about bus lanes, but there is more, right? Um, um, earlier this year in the New York state budget, we got approval to begin ticketing uh, violations at bus stops and double parking instances. Uh, these are there are multiple uh, instances where our bus stops are blocked. Uh, bus lanes or, or regular lanes are completely blocked because of double or triple parking instances. And guess what? Our customers on our buses are the ones who are delayed. In fact, some of these uh, pictures show some pretty egregious examples here. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see multiple cars just parked at our bus stops which impede the access of the bus operator to park at the bus stop and for people to get out safely from the bus. Um, the pictures on the right actually show instances where you have double parking and triple parking. <laughs> in fact, the, the, the bottom right picture show you, shows you an instance where, a where these cars are triple parked. Come on, how can our buses move uh, properly this way? So uh, we think that this demonstration program that's been established by the New York state budget over we have dem demonstrate the feasibility of this program over a period of four years uh, would go a long way in changing the behavior of exactly instances like this, where people completely block our lanes or double park uh, as they as they wish. And I and we think that this has the potential to Im impact all routes, not just bus lanes, right? Because you can implement uh, enforcement of bus stops and bus lane uh, and double parking instances across all routes, making our roads 
that much more safer, making our travel that much more faster. And of course, it translates back to getting ridership and, um, and customer satisfaction back high. So, I, I, you know, there is a lot of potential here. Um, we've done a little bit of a preliminary analysis uh, to make sure what would be the potential for speed increases once we start to, you know, go outside of the bus lane across to bus stops and double parking instances. And what we are seeing is uh, there is a potential for approximately 25% uh, increase in speed in the PM peak on some routes. Again, this is to be seen once we start to, you know, put this, uh, put, put this technology out there. Um, even on collision reduction, uh, from but just from bus stop enforcement, uh, there is potential for a 10% reduction in collisions and another 10% from double parking. And the good part is this is going to uh, mm -hmm. make things better for approximately 950,000 daily riders by the end of the demonstration program. So the ambit of this program is fairly large in terms of touching people that we carry on a regular basis. So uh, I'm very excited about uh, you know, the next steps in terms of bringing this to uh, fruition. Um, that's that's a that's a super quick uh, overview on uh, on automated camera enforcement. The next step uh, that I also look at is the zero emissions transformation. I'll uh, quickly talk through where we are and uh, and what the opportunities are and uh, some of the criteria that we use in terms of uh, managing the program. Uh, as Sean touched on uh, touched on this uh, earlier, just by the MTA existing in the city we avoid almost 20 million metric tons of greenhouse gases on an annual basis. A 100% zero emissions conversion of our buses has the potential to reduce these greenhouse gases by another 500,000 metric tons annually, which is huge. You know, we would, we would be reducing New York City's greenhouse gas imprint by huge amounts just by moving our buses from a fossil fuel fleet to a zero emissions fleet. And it's not just buses, it's 5,800 buses. It's 1,300 paratransit vehicles that we have to convert, and it's 1,800 non-revenue vehicles that do a lot of maintenance slash ancillary work in support of uh, services. So we think that the amount of carbon avoidance as a result of the complete conversion, not just buses, but all the other ancillary vehicles, is much more than 500,000 metric tons. And we have to do this by 2040. So um, I think we have our plan kind of cut out for us, and uh, we are excited to this program too. Uh, and what we have done so far, this is kind of a high level overview. I know the chart is a little uh, um, <laughs> uh, cluttered here, but uh, this is a high level overview of what we've done. Back in 2018, we made a commitment uh, to be 100% zero emissions by 2040. We started working with multiple manufacturers right away. Uh, we, we ran a 10 bus, two manufacturer pilot for three years back in 2018. It was. It went on till 2021, uh, beginning of 2021. It was fantastic in terms of learning, not just uh, zero emission buses, but also charging infrastructure technology, as well as getting new power at our depots. Subsequently, we made sure that the 2020 to 2024 capital plan had sufficient money and funding for 500 battery electric buses. Uh, right before COVID, we got our first purchase of articulated zero emission buses. That was 15 buses that entered, entered the property uh, right before COVID. They've been running revenue service ever since. And I wanna say we continue to learn lessons from them on a daily basis. So that's been one of the best things in terms of making sure that we are slowly getting ready for larger and larger number of buses as we start to expand the program. In addition, what we did um, uh, as part of the program is really put together a project management office that actually manages the entire program across multiple divisions and groups in the agency. We also put a public transition plan that laid out exactly how we are going to get from here to there and all the different pieces, workforce transition, infra infrastructure trans transition, the electricity transition, depot refurbishment, and there's a whole lot of pieces that come together. That link actually takes you right to the transition plan in case you're interested. Um, also happy to say that uh, later this year and over the course of next year, we'll be getting our first uh, uh, 60, 40 foot standard electric buses that will operate out of five depots uh, in the agency. Uh, there, there is a lot of work that goes on, you, you know, working with New York Power Authority to, to deploy the charging infrastructure at the depots, working with our partners at Con Edison 
to, to get new power at the, at the depots. And all of this is really a, a, a stepping stage for, you know, as we start to convert to larger and larger numbers of buses. Next slide, please. Oh, what are we doing right now? Uh, well, we are acting on the current capital plan. The 2020 to 2024 capital plan calls for a uh, purchase of up to 470 battery electric buses, arguably the largest procurement of battery electric buses in the country. Uh, uh, we are on target to award um, that contract by the end of this year, potentially to one or more bus manufacturers. Those buses would start to come to the property by mid-2025, or and, and, and there's a second tranche that would come by mid-2026. But it's not just the buses, right? You have to build the infrastructure at the depots to support these buses, charge these buses, and make sure that the buses get out uh, of the depots to, to, to do their revenue runs. So to, to, to make sure that happens, we also put a design build RFP for, in, for infrastructure build out. And that is happening right now. We are, we are putting out the RFP, awarding the RFP to qualified design builders who would come on property and start the construction process over Q2 of next year. So we hope to complete the construction process at five depots by mid 2025 in time to meet the first set of buses. And we hope to complete the second uh, or the second tranche in, in, by, by Q2 of 2026 in time to meet the second tranche of uh, uh, buses. So it is a tightly choreographed set of activities that need to happen across buses, infrastructure, and of course, new power supply. Because um, you, you can't just put up uh, charging infrastructure at these depots without you know, the necessary electric power. So six of these depots ne need new power uh, from Con Edison. And I, and I just want to add that the work that we are doing with Con Edison is just fantastic. They've been uh, such great partners as part of this process. Uh, this, is, this is a super high level picture for, for you uh, as we start to expand the program. Uh, right now, we are doing 500 buses in this capital plan, which would go uh, up to about 2027 thereabouts. The next capital plan calls for doubling that number of buses, the 2025 to 2029 capital plan. It's about 1,000 buses, which is about a quarter of our fleet would be converted. 2029 is an important year for us because we've publicly announced that that would be the last year when we would buy a non-zero emissions bus. Any bus bought after that would be a fully zero emissions bus. You know, zero emissions means it could be battery electric or hydrogen fuel cell and things like that, but it would be a zero emissions bus. And then of course we continue to expand, right? 2030 to 2034 capital plan calls for an approximate 60% fleet conversion. And then of course we get to 35 to 39, where it's not just the buses, but the paratransit vehicles would be transitioned and the non-revenue fleet would be transitioned. So you might ask, what are the criteria that we use as part of this transition? How do we decide which depots these buses go to? Well, primary is making sure that we adhere to the environmental justice parameters and the equity scores that we've assigned to all parts of the city and make sure that our buses go, go to those areas in the city that are most disadvantaged, both in terms of air quality as well as social factors. So. So those are, the, those are the places that we want to prioritize the deployment of these buses first. Those are the depots that we want to prioritize. Those are the routes that we want to prioritize the deployment of these depots for uh, these, these buses first so that they get the benefits of clean uh, you know, transit. Uh, we also want to make sure that these buses are distributed across all five boroughs so that the distribution is kind of equal. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, we use available power at the depots to the maximum extent possible so that we can start to ramp up slowly rather than, you know, electrify all of your depots, putting Con Edison at a difficult kind of juncture in terms of provisioning all that power. We also want to make sure that the depots that we select um, 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 are, are, do not have a really large ser service impact, which means that you wouldn't want to look at a depot where you want to convert all 200 of your buses because that would be super disruptive to existing operations at your depot. So you want to judiciously select your depots based on, okay, the amount of service impact at this depot is this percentage based on these other factors. And hence, I've decided that this would be the set of depots and things like that. So that's what we've done in terms of deciding uh, where these buses go. And lastly, schedule feasibility. You want to make sure that given the 
range issues, given the amount of charging time that it takes and things like that, you want to make sure that you put these buses at those depots initially where the schedules at the depot match up to what is technically available for the bus in terms of making those schedules. So there are a, there are a bunch of additional, uh, you know, core criteria that 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 deals with how you put these buses, and um, um, you know, it's a it's a delicate dance, but uh, but we do it uh, with every capital plan. And you might ask, uh, you know, what are the challenges? Of course, there are there are lots of challenges. Um, some of the prime challenges here is that um, right now the entire industry is in a little bit of a transition. Um, electric vehicles do not get the advertised range that the that the manufacturer has advertised when the temperature drops so that's that's a known issue um it is it is due to the dynamics of way the of the way batteries discharge and charge and things like that so that's a known issue so uh, that that is a challenge that the industry is dealing with charging time is significantly greater than filling up a fuel tank uh, filling up a gas tank um buses have to remain underneath a pantograph to charge approximately four to six hours, whereas you can, you know, fill up a gas in nine minutes. <laughs> so there, there, there are significant differences when you move over to a zero emissions uh, on bus. Um, battery cost is high. Uh, in fact, battery is the single most expensive part of a zero emissions bus. And we need to see improvements in terms of reliability on those batteries so that they can last potentially the life of the bus. Right now it's between eight to 10 years, but we want to see it last between 12 and 15 years. And improvements in battery chemistry are only starting to come through. We want to ensure that the raw materials used in the batteries are from sustainable sources. It's not like the MTA can really do much, but we have to slowly push the industry, push multiple transit agencies around the country to send the same message that battery manufacturers need to source their raw materials from sustainable sources rather than you know the stories that we've seen about uh, nickel mining and cobalt mining mining in um, in third world countries and uh, and it's difficult to read those stories so slowly push towards sustainable sourcing of um, battery uh, um, uh, mate uh, raw materials expanded grid is super important in order to get to a zero emissions basis you want to make sure that your grid is also zero emissions based and that takes time that takes a lot more interconnection networks from the likes of Con Edison and from the likes of the feds to push those interconnection networks so that, so that your power from renewables at the source is delivered quickly to, to where it's absolutely needed. And that takes a lot of time and expanded grid is super important in terms of managing this transition. Um, electric vehicles are much heavier than regular vehicles because the battery is a pretty heavy entity that sits on the bus. And you know, it's not like the fuel tank that, that empties out. The battery is carried with the bus, whether the battery is uh, charged up or not. So, uh, so um, manufacturers need to invest in um, you know, lighter weight materials, um, composites, um, better aerodynamic designs, so that the range of the bus is improved while keeping the battery weights uh, uh, normal. You know, uh, uh, and and lastly, resiliency plans. Uh, that's 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 so important given all the climate change uh, um, uh, considerations that we've heard, uh, that we know, that we keep reading about. Uh, so resiliency plans to bring back up service in the event of catastrophic storms or in the event of you know extreme cold spells and things like that need to be worked out. It's not like we worked out all of this, but acknowledging that these are the challenges. Um, helps prepare the team for appropriately planning and strategizing the rollout itself. Well, it's not it's it's all uh, not gloom and deal and doom. There is a lot of opportunity here. Um, I think the biggest opportunity is to make sure that our workforce is appropriately trained so that they can meet this challenge head on. Right? Um, it's not just bus maintenance. It is um, infrastructure maintenance and upkeep. It is battery maintenance and upkeep. It is high power electronics maintenance and upkeep. So there is a, there is a lot of additional skills that come to bear and, and our workforce can utilize uh, um, all these new technologies, new education opportunities in upskilling themselves and making sure that they are ready to meet the, the challenges of the future. And it's not just our workforce, it's essentially sending this message out to local community colleges so that they, in, incorporate elements of this into their curricula 
so that we get the right set of talent back in for our future, I don't know, maintainers, dispatchers, uh, managers, you know, everybody. So there is a lot of opportunity in terms of workforce development. Um, and and of course... I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt you, but I do want to give people time to ask questions. Now, we're sure, uh, at our, at yeah. our time. So um, if, I don't know if you wanted to wrap that up. Wrap, uh, I wrap think up. we are almost done. Uh, yeah. You know, the, the, just, just, just a couple more points. Um, I want to say that in addition to zero emission battery electric vehicles, we also see a large future in the space for hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, which does not need the large amounts of infrastructure build out at depots, which does not need the large amount of electricity supply at depots, and it does not need the um, amount of time that it takes to charge up a bus even. So we see a, we see a lot of future in the hydrogen fuel cell space, but you know, again, it's slow steps and we'll slowly get there. Um, I'm going to wrap it up. Given my time constraints, I did not realize that I ran over time. I'm sorry, but uh, I'm more than happy to I'm answer sorry, questions at this time. Yeah, we have yeah. some questions. questions. Question, Sunil. Yeah. What happens if somebody, a motorist, ignores the notice of liability? How can somebody prove that they actually, how can the MTA or anyone, traffic, anybody, prove that they got it? It's sent regular mail, I believe it said in the, uh, in mm -hmm. the earlier slide. Yeah, so, of course. Uh, so what we do is, it's not just one bus, um, spotting a motorist on a bus lane that results in a ticket, we make sure that the motorist is on a bus lane at least for five minutes, which means that two buses passing by a motorist five minutes apart needs to capture the motorist's license plate and all the other details. And both of these need to be kind of combined in the form of an evidence package. And that evidence package is what is reviewed by DOT, making sure that the violation is modified, you know? So, uh, is that is that is oh, that I'm what not you're questioning? I'm not questioning whether the person is guilty or not. I'm questioning how do you, does DOT prove that the recipient of the notice of liability actually received it? They don't care. They say once they have sent it, you're responsible. That's how I got uh, a thousand dollars. No. Dollar no. The it's like the, a red light camera. No. Am I correct? Is, is it like a red light camera? No. The exactly. Notice of viola the notice of violation is called ABLE and you have the ability to view the clip yeah. entering a PIN number that's displayed on the notice of violation. So the administrative law judge who's reviewing your appeal or the person who receives the notice has the ability to make a determination whether they want to move forward uh, with uh, appealing it. Uh, and, and as Sunil said, you know, it's based on the amount of time traveling in the lane because they're curbside lanes, you know, the bus lane may not necessarily be at the curb. So you may have to enter a bus lane to get to a curb lane. But if you're traveling for the time he was talking about, the judge would see that and find you guilty. I understand that part of it. I'm just wondering, how does a, someone who's violated the bus lanes... You can be, they will keep sending you letters. You could be, keep and if you keep letters. ignoring them, what then? You know, they they just make us yeah. so the yes. and There's a penalty for non-payment. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and, and, and your license will be suspended. Yeah. 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 And yeah. And we do your license until your registration. Your registration should be suspended. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Either, either one or Other questions? Chris? Yeah. I saw on your PowerPoint earlier, and I think that was 27 minutes ago, uh, you mentioned buses <clears throat> where fare invasion is. Uh, I'm glad to know that parts of Brooklyn does exist and other Queens as well, as well as areas, but you guys left out a lot more bus. There is more fa fare invasion. For starters, the, uh, I did not see, because it was small, but I'm guessing, unless someone can back me up on, I did not see some of the select buses. That's oh. number one. 
thank you. I know that's why I said thank you. <laughs> Second, local buses are also getting this hard too. For example, in in Brighton Beach on the B1 and the B68, and for the record, Frank knows about this because he is with, he's working on that. Just to get that quick. The bottom line is is it's not the students that we have to sometimes worry. We have to worry about the adults that don't pay also. So we really need to work on that as well as language also because there are... That's outside of the field. Yeah, that's well, not, if he's mentioned the fare invasion, it is still part of that he's bringing up, but I am sharing this in we your... We have to worry about everybody who evades the fare. That's, thank you, Andrew. Mm -hmm. Correct. It is everyone, and I'm saying when I say adults, I mean everyone. 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 But, everyone. The, but, but the adults the are more right now, you know, not showing to the kids, so it really goes to the mothers and dads. Oh, I'm, what, what I'm, let me just get to the, let me just get my thought in. We just need to see that lift a little more because it's small, but it, it, there's much more other bus routes in all the boroughs, especially Staten Island. Because I have seen this on even on the Select 79 bus. So, can we please have a bigger list to see in the future? Future? We'll do. We'll do. Yeah. Yeah. Stuart? Neil, at the end of the presentation, where you talk about, you know, it's inevitable that we're going to have to go electric with uh, all or a portion of the fleet. But if um, if power generation sources fail, you know, um, you were talking about having, uh, you know, a mixture of types of buses so that we're not totally vulnerable. But, uh, you know, years ago, many years ago, the authority did its own power generation. Uh, is there any thought being given to that again, or, or we'd be reliant on Con Ed or... Um... Right. Great question. Great question. Um, yeah. Right now, I... I... Do not, I, I don't think the authority is planning any forays into power generation itself. Uh, our immediate plans are really to work closely with Con Edison in making sure that we have the necessary power over the you know stepwise improvement uh, increases in buses. Right. That said, we also know that Con Edison is actively working with multiple contractors and entities in the area to improve the amount of or the percentage of their renewable power mix, which means that they would not be reliant on things like coal, you know, coal-fired plants and uh, and uh, other polluting type plants. They would start to source their energy from the likes of, uh, you know, wind and solar and things like that. In addition, uh, specifically with respect to your question, Con Edison is also investing a large amount in energy storage systems across the city, which is really large battery banks to you know, uh, temporarily uh, take over the power uh, sourcing in the event of a disaster. So all of this is in the works, uh, but again, this is a, it's a long haul and we have to continue to work with them closely to understand what the next steps are. But no, the authority is not planning anything right now. So thank you, battery banks is, is a great idea. Thank you. Yes, um, yeah, of course. So a couple of years ago, we had looked at, at electrification. I know that then there were really, it was really a, sort of an interesting dynamic that there were long-lasting batteries, but they were very heavy, or there were um, the buses that had the ability to really travel longer, but the batteries weren't as good. So have the bus, bus bodies and battery types caught up to each other so that it's a better, um, better you know, product? Fantastic question. So um, there are two things that's happening. Uh, one is the structure of the bus, which is the bus frame itself has been adequately um, strengthened to take the additional weight of the battery, right? So that, that's the first piece. And, and we have made sure to uh, qualify those frames so that they work on New York City roads. Secondly, uh, we are noticing that in the battery, battery industry itself, the amount of power that can be stored in a particular volume of battery is slowly increasing. And we predict that over the next 10 to 12 years, you'd see a 12 to 15% increase in the amount of power that can be stored in the same volume, which means your battery chemistry is improving, which, which, which also means the amount of energy available to you 
for a particular run on your block is also that much more better. So yeah, it's absolutely happening on both fronts that you just mentioned, you know? And of course, there's a whole bunch of other things, efficiency gains on the on the bus itself in terms of making sure that you um, uh, harvest all the, um, what, what they call parasitic heat loads that will heat the bus and things like that. So there's a lot of um, 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 innovations happening in the industry. And, and I'm glad that we are early on taking on these challenges and making sure that we are positioned appropriately for, you know, the expansion and the and the rollout. Um, I think, I that, think that, are... that ends that. Thank you so much for this presentation, Sunil. So of course. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Very interesting. Thank you. Keep us posted. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Um, okay. I did not actually get to finish my chair's report, so let me move quickly on the rest of that. Um, so we recently had another station renovation, which was Junction Boulevard on the 7 line, which so many aspects of the station were updated and upgraded, uh, which many of the elected officials, including one of our former members who is now a member of the Assembly, was there to uh, comment on, uh, Assembly member Jessica Gonzalez Rojas. And um, there are a host of new other stations set, Morris Park on the 5, Whitehall Street on the R, Hunters Point Avenue on the 7, Beverly Road on the Q, Baychester Avenue on the 5, Wall Street on the 2, 3, Ditmas on the F, 8th Street NYU on the RW, 191st on the 1, Howard Beach JFK Airport on the A, and Court Street on the R. So they are really in the process of doing a lot of renovations. Uh, they're looking, you know, at 30 a year or something like that. I mean, they're, they're really upping it. 50 a year, if, if we're lucky. I, I don't know that that's possible, but that would be an awful lot of GOs at the same time. But uh, in any event, um, they're hoping for 50. But... Um, yeah. What did I say? You had something on the R. You said the seven line. Whitehall Street, he said R. But R -W. Whitehall, R-W. Yeah. You're getting into all my um, No discrimination. <laughs> uh, and then, let me just go to this. Um, here's some, some actual good news. Um, yesterday, Fitch uh, updated, upgraded the MTA's credit rating to A from A minus, so that makes S&P, Moody's, mm -hmm. and Fitch who have all upgraded the MTA's uh, credit rating, which, which means that it's lower for borrowing. It's a really good sign. It's a, it's a sign that, you know, having the state and the legislature and the governor give us five years of, of guaranteed funding, it was a good move. And um, also, of course, you've all heard that Senator Schumer was able to procure $3.4 billion for phase two of Second Avenue. Yes which pretty much guarantees it will go to 125th and Lexington. Um, they've already been doing some preliminary work um, with elect electrical work. There, were, there actually is a section of tunnel that was completed a long time ago, which they will utilize again and expand and make a little more uh, today friendly than it was. But um, so all of those seem to be pretty good signs for the MTA. Uh, we hope that ridership continues to rebound as it has because that and, uh, and um, the continued support of our elected uh, and, and uh, the federal government are the keys to having us do all of the great things that we heard mentioned today. Um, it, it's, a, it's a team job and we all have to be part of it and I really want us to be able to contribute to these things, which is why I asked when we can make suggestions for the 20-year uh, needs assessment, uh, because I don't believe that outreach was ever done to the public, to be quite honest. Term. Yes, uh, Stuart. Well, that was a great point about having our concerns translated into the document, but something again that Sunil raised, it was a very comprehensive presentation. It really yeah. should have been two separate yeah, talks. It was very comprehensive. The latter talked about yeah. the reliance on electric devices. You know, it could mean that we need more land, capital acquisition, structures, certainly staffing if the existing, st but again, like right now, being in that world of uh, resiliency and uh, 
working closely with NASM, when we have power failures, you know, you have to have a backup plan. And if the percentage of the fleet that will be totally electric or, uh, you know, I'm glad to hear that he talked about these uh, or kind of uh, plan about uh, uh, battery sites and storage sites. But again, I think when we talk about our 20-year plan, because this is coming, uh, that we give attention to, to this, given this is inevitable, it's the law, you know. And Bert has an interesting yeah. point on that. I, I have a point that just came up this morning. I heard Nikki Haley, who was out burning for whatever she is. She's running for president. She brought up the fact that there's a whole new problem that they're working on, and I hadn't heard this one before, that the fact that the electric fleet, they go entirely electric, will create vast increases in highway maintenance because yeah. everything is heavier. I hadn't heard this one before, but she's now projecting the entire highway system is going to have to it be rebuilt. It, it makes sense. The weight of the battery. And yeah, but now he's saying the battery weights are coming down, but I had never heard this, and she's doing this as a presidential candidate. One of the, one of the, uh, one of the, one of the, one of the, that's being looked at to fund transportation moving forward from the highway trust fund gas since the gas tax is gone away. Oh, well, that's a good know, point, the, yeah. Yeah, um, is, is electric vehicle charging um, time, infrastructure, and the like so that they grow the electric vehicle. Now, we in New York are so far behind electric vehicle, uh, electric vehicle, electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Yeah. But places like Utah, Georgia, um, California have so much of the infrastructure and the vehicles that they do that it is possible that they will fund the, the bulk of the portions of their transportation system, including highway maintenance, okay. um, and the, you know, the balance yeah. to get some of this transit, even in places like Utah, um, to because of the enormity of the of their reliance on electric vehicles and the shift that they're doing. But I don't know that they're doing it because of the um, additional um, additional weight, the additional, additional issues on you know the roadway services as much as it is another revenue source. You made Utah sound like a town. Utah, Georgia, you said. Utah, <laughs> 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 Um, anything else? Old business. Uh, Andrew, I do have old business. Uh, how old is it? No, uh, just kidding. Go ahead. I, I was gonna, I was gonna say it for you, but then okay. that's okay. Um, and I don't want to be disrespectful, but uh, Andrew, I do want to say thank you for something because they did a video of Seventh Avenue Station, and I did share it on Facebook, and the communities have been saying thank you, and the, and I said to them, it's not just me, it was everyone. But a lot of the people are asking because they know this was a Andrew Albert moment, so they want me to say, excuse me, I am just a messenger, just want to say, they want to say thank you because you have seniors and disabilities, the ones who, have, who can actually go up the steps at 7th Avenue and on the B and Q. They're saying thank you because for once they can see the light, if you know what I mean, like Atlantic. It is being, so I wanted to give you that good I was news. really happy to see that yes. put on the renovation list. And, and, and as we advocate, we just need to continue, and I remind people, put that on the app. And I have said this yesterday, and I'm going to still say it until I blow up. Ooh. Why not to blow up? Why not to blow up? Not, not to blow up. Not to blow up. Not to blow up. Not to blow up. Not to blow I just got you all laughing. That's a good one. It's an old business. I, you know, so I always talk about cleaning as I yep. go throughout the system for various things. So I happen to be on the 2nd Avenue line, uh, I think, in your neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, in 72nd. That's my neighborhood. Well, I, I was out of your yeah, yeah. Oh, please. Yeah, please. So, uh, Great station. So, so, you know, they're all deep stations. And you go down. Uh, I happen to be at the 69th Street exit. Oh, 72nd. Right. Oh, the 72nd Street stop. Right, right. Oh, three stations. So, three station. Right. So if you're going down the escalator, you could see 
that there is huge amounts of dust and people were, I don't know how they did this, but they, they were writing on the dust, clean me. <laughs> um, so, you know, at, in that particular station, the design is to have glass or plastic that's in a circle on the, the, the escalator yeah. canopy, and it's filthy. Uh, but, New York one, actually. But it, <laughs> oh, it's just, yeah. you know, no, it's, 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 it's been an issue for people who live yeah. Let, let's do it just so that, and, and then again, uh, of course, the 8th Avenue line, again, the station, including Fulton Street, it's still a mixed bag. You know, it's, it's not consistently... Uh, I'm seeing more and more cleaners out on the platforms as I travel, interestingly. Uh, whether they're reaching the places like where they, people wrote, clean me, uh, uh, at 69th Street and at 72nd Street. That was an entrance. Okay. Yeah. But, um, uh, interest should be on clean. the 8th Avenue line, the uh, platforms uh, totally different on the Lexington uh, It's train. all the way uh, on every station, uh, all three, uh, all the entrances. Yeah. Uh, you, right. you should try 86th Street if you want to see. I'll, I'll I see the 5th. But it's just, again, I think we need to get a better handle on the schedule and, and what attention they give to certainly platforms and fixtures, you know, because... I can... Uh, I can I'll research further. That's all. Yeah, to prolong it. Direct. This is a note I gave you. Business, mm -hmm. Burger Street, F and G train. Keep the platforms dismissed. Keep the tracks dismissed the platforms. Is that on both sides of Bergen Street? Yes, Burger Street being F and G train. Keep the low level tracks dismissed. Oh, fix the express tracks on that line. They were used at one time. They're using oh, them they again. Did. They've done some geos and used them. Okay, but they don't use them below Fourth Avenue. They don't use them above Fourth Avenue. <laughs> I, I agree with they you. They need to use them above and below Fourth Avenue to avoid confusion. I want to see trains using them at all times. We have these two trains on that line. So all times one can run express, the other can run multiple. The problem with that scenario is you have to rebuild the platforms on the lower level of Bergen Street if you're going to reuse those platforms. You don't want to go nonstop from J Street to Carroll Street or, you know, uh, or to uh, 7th Avenue. Yeah, you don't want to do that. You don't want to miss a, a big neighborhood. All those stops. You don't want to miss that. Cobble Hill and... Well, this is so business. I mean, it would be nice because there was a time when they expressed below Burger Street. No. Why they want they should have ran express below J, J Street, not Burger Street. All these residents complain about no, this is getting ridiculous. Okay? That Diamond F train was unnecessary. I I opposed it. Yeah, me too. Okay. There's only two in each direction. The, the MTA uh, no, 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 no. should have done it my way, not his way. But apparently he prefers dance like a broadcast. Okay, we're running out of time, so I think we yeah. need to move to new business now. Uh, Chris. Uh, Andrew, uh, regarding some new business, and I did mention this yesterday, and I think this is a, something maybe we should maybe keep an eye on as an eye from now to, let's say, to February. One eye? Uh, you can do one eye. I'm going to do four eyes. Okay. As, a, as a, an old person, told, a legend person told me that. Um, because... What I'm seeing is, 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 you know, when we put in complaints, requests, or compliments, which I do so many on this phone, okay. uh, we do need to do an app, maybe, you know, watch how people know how to use it or know about it, because as I've been checking myself around for the last two or three months, people don't even know what the heck I was talking about. Not even What's the topic we're talking the about? The app. The app. Which app? The, com the comment, com comment feedback one. Oh, that. It's not. You mean the beta app that the MTA what? is testing? No, not no. that one. The, com app? the comment complaint one. Oh, that app. Okay. Nobody knows what I'm talking about. And you know what even disturbed me last night? <laughs> A lot of our politicians never heard of it. And I'm looking at them like, uh, hello, in 2021, it was mentioned on a video during ADA 31. But oh. as I said again, is can we please... Uh, Get, no. 
No, no. That's the right. We got all the control. We're just talking about a basis. Let's say, if, let's say, example, like Stuart has the complaint about uh, the, let's say, an F train was so dirty. He puts it in. He may know how to put it in. But let's say someone else, say, named Hickety Dickety Doc, did not know about it. We need to see that, Kurt. We need to see that because people should just say, go to the phone. And at least it's advertised in stations. No. Okay. That's probably what it should be. It should be. It's not even advertised. It should, should, be, be, should be flashing on the uh, on the uh, electronic ads. So he's suggesting that we get the word out either through press release. Through the MTA should get the word out. The MTA, not to get the word out, but the MTA. Right. If we can suggest to the MTA to communicate, we will do that. that. They communicate. So we're asking for communication. Yes, we got it. Okay. Mr. X. Okay, and, I, and it is now 204. Yep. Go ahead, Mr. X. Okay. Do this, please. Go ahead. Seventh Avenue, BHU train, 8th Avenue, which is actually Grand Rapids Plaza, 254 train, is nearby. There's no physical connection between us, and it should be because of the east uh, projection at Atlantic Avenue. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a request <laughs> for these connectors and these projects. I'd like to speak to our chair about how we're going to collect um, these projects. I don't want to do it piecemeal, so I don't, I don't lose them. I, I think I have some thoughts. I want to talk to the staff okay. and to the chair um, about how we do it across all the councils. Okay? There, there are many. Just, there, I know that there are, but I don't want to lose them. There's a lot, of, to well, a lot of potential that okay. we don't want to lose. Okay. If, we've been, if we've been offered to provide our input, I want to do, I want to do it. In a way that really provides it in a in a thoughtful, orderly, uh, yeah. way. Agreed. Okay, so Agreed. I want to um, because you got really good ideas, Second. and I don't want to lose them or miss them. Mm. Actually, an email then you won't lose them. I, that's good. Agree. 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 That's good. Agree. 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 I hear that, and thank you all. Thank you, Tony. Maybe we'll to the line and clear our church.